Praise the Lord. Always happy to be in a no good stage. Your excitement is growing day by day. And I pray that the power of God will touch every life tonight in Jesus' name. This session will be a session for our leaders. And we know that we have our workers and members who are here tonight. I just want you to patiently listen to everything, even though we're having a leaders meeting. And then after the leaders session, something will come. And tonight, you'll never be the same in Jesus' name. I'm sure you're ready. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this moment. Thank you for your people here. Thank you for the joy and the excitement of worshiping you that we always find here. And I pray, Lord, the joy of the Lord will ever continue, even with your people here in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, now you transform every leader every worker all those who are here you know lord impact our lives in jesus name that our leadership will never be the same again our ministry will never be the same again the impact of our activities will never be the same again in jesus name be glorified in our church in Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. You would have noticed that during the time of searching the scriptures together, we looked at 1 Samuel chapter 24 and 1 Samuel chapter 26. And we saw something there, quite a lot of things there. I want to show you something in 1 Samuel chapter 13. And I'm reading here from verse 14. 1 Samuel chapter 13 verse 14. But now, talking to Saul, thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be captain, to be ruler, to be king over his people. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart so that he will be leader over the people. And God gave him a ministry. I'm coming now to 1 Samuel chapter 24. And I'm reading from verse 8. David also arose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord the King. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped, bent, bowed with his face to the earth. He bowed himself. And David said, to Saul, wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy heart. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how the Lord had delivered thee today into mine hand in the cave, and some bid me kill thee. But my eyes spared thee. And I said, I will not put forth my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Verse 17. And he said to David, Thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded the evil. Well, I knew something about the life of David. 
And tonight I'm teaching the word of God on the uniqueness of ministers after God's own heart. The uniqueness of ministers after God's own heart. You see what God said about David. He could have said that about most. He could have said that about Samuel. He could have said that about Elijah. And he could have said that about Daniel. He could have said that about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He could have said that about Peter. He could have said that about Paul the Apostle. The point is this. If anybody is going to be a minister, a minister of quality, a minister that pleases God, he must be a man after God's own heart. Go beyond that. If you're going to be a child of God, a son in the kingdom, a daughter in the kingdom, there is one thing God is looking for, a son after God's own heart, a daughter after God's own heart. Go beyond that. If you're going to be a father, you're going to be a mother that pleases God, walking with God. You must be a father, a mother, after God's own heart. If you're going to be a worker, any work you do in the kingdom of God, what God wants, what God is looking for, is a worker after God's own heart. Are you going to be a pastor? Are you a soul winner? Are you an evangelist? Are you an apostle? Whatever it is, must be a man, must be a minister after God's own heart. And you must understand that what God is looking for today, there are men, there are women who are in the leadership and their heart is in line with the very heart of God. In fact, it tells us in Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12, it tells us, what things will be in the last time, in the last days, in the time in which we are living, when the new covenant comes in, and then we come into the kingdom, we're born again, we're children of God, and we come to offer our service to the Lord. What kind of person should we be? Look at Zechariah chapter 12, verse 8. In that day, at the end of time in that day in that day when the lord will open again the fountain of mercy for the children of israel in the latter time in that day shall the lord defend the inhabitants of jerusalem and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as david that he is if we say in this time now at this dispensation now i am feeble i am weak i don't know too much it says in this time and dispensation as christ has come as christ died for us on the cross of calvary and he has brought us back to what adam lost in the garden of eden it says the feeble among them shall be as david and the house of david shall be as god as the angel of the Lord before them. You see the purpose? You see the prophecy? You see the promise? You see the plan of God? You see what he wants to accomplish? He wants to make us more like God. And so he wants us to be ministers who have the might of Christ and ministers who are after the heart of God. The uniqueness of ministers after God's own heart. We're looking at these two chapters today. First Samuel, come back to First Samuel, chapter twenty-four, as well as chapter twenty-six. And I'm looking at these things that concern David. And as the Lord had said that the feeble among us will be like David. And the people who are normal, the house of David, will, will be like the angels of God. I want to look at three things that should characterize your life, characterize your ministry, characterize your influence, characterize everything concerning you as a minister of the gospel. Number one, 
recognizing and rejecting ungodly counsels. Recognizing, you recognize it. It is not every counsel that is godly. It is not every counsel that is acceptable in the sight of God. You recognize and you reject ungodly counsels. Number two, reviving and retaining an unfettered conscience, an unsilenced conscience, an unseared conscience, a conscience that is awake, a conscience that is at large, a conscience that is sensitive when anything comes to make you deviate from the path of righteousness. Revive such a conscience. Retain such a conscience. Reviving and retaining an unfettered, unsilenced, unseared conscience. Number three, reaffirming and reproducing uncompromising conquerors. That is your minister and you are a worker in the kingdom of God. What kind of people will your ministry, what kind of people should your preaching, what kind of people should your life reproduce on compromising conquerors? That's what we're talking about. Reaffirm that again. If there's anything we need today, we need Christians that have backbone. We need Christians that know the truth. And we need Christians that will stand for the truth. Reproduce them and send them everywhere. Let the people that come to your ministry, through your ministry, in your ministry, let there be people, let them be people that understand, I am here so that God will do something in me. And then I reaffirm the necessity of an uncompromising stand in my life. So, we're talking about reaffirming and reproducing uncompromising conquerors. Number one, tell me number one there. Recognizing and rejecting ungodly counsels. We're coming to First Samuel, and I'm reading from chapter 24, verse 4. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of his robe. In verse 5, And it came to pass afterwards, then they come to verse 6, and he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this sin unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Somebody counseled David. Some men counseled David. David. They were his supporters. They were his servants. They were his sympathizers. They were the people around him. They saw Saul. Saul was asleep. And his servants were asleep. And he said, David, the time has come. This is your enemy. The Lord has delivered your enemy into your hand. Kill him. And David recognized that that counsel is ungodly. That advice is ungodly. That idea is ungodly. There are people today, they call themselves Christians. They call themselves preachers. They call themselves pastors. And if they see anything, any bad thing that will happen to the enemy, they say, praise the Lord, the Lord is fighting for me. Praise the Lord, the Lord is defending me. The man must die. Let him die. That's not a Christian attitude. Love your enemy. Do good to them that do evil to you. 
and the people that misuse you, misrepresent you, and mistreat you, that you will show the grace of God that you are born again, that you are sanctified, that you are a child of God. So David said, I recognize that advice, it's ungodly. I recognize that counseling, it's ungodly. I reject it. If you're going to be a man after God's heart, a pastor after God's heart, a leader after God's heart, a parent after God's heart, a worker after God's heart, you will recognize ungodly counsels and you will reject that ungodly counsel. He said, God forbid, the Lord forbid, that I should do this sin to my master. He still called the master. Saul, persecuting him, he said, is my master. Saul, driving and chasing me about, he said, is my master. You know what? There are some people, if they even do wrong, in the case of David, he did nothing wrong. And it was just the hatred in the heart, the depravity in the heart of Saul that made him to be chasing him about. There are some people, if they even do wrong, and you correct them, and you discipline them, and you say, step aside and pray some time so you get yourself ready for real ministry, they have animosity in their hearts. Hatred in their hearts. Bad, bad thoughts in their hearts. And they wish that person that corrected them, wanting them to get to heaven, they wish that person something bad will happen. Not David. You're not going to be a man after God's heart, a woman after God's heart. You're not going to be a child after God's heart when you entertain, when you nurse those evil things in your heart. And it, because of what you nurse, your touch, the anointed of the Lord. You know about David? He remembered the word of God. Touch, not an anointed. And do my prophets no harm? He said, whatever happens to me, that word of God, I am going to uphold. Another chance came in chapter 26. Chapter 26, I'm reading from verse 7. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench. And his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. But Abner the pe and the people lay round about him, round about Saul. And then said Abishai to David, God has delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore, let me smite him. Don't do it, David. I'll do it for you. I'll do it on your behalf. You won't touch him. I will do it. I'll smite him. And then he goes on to say, I pray thee with the spear, even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. Look up here for a moment. There are some people. I'm a Christian. I'm a worker. I'm a pastor. And some people want to do the Jew on their behalf. They say, my hand is not there. You are my uncle. You are my cousin. You know, I'm in deep alive. If you say that you want to help me solve this problem, and because of that, you want to go and do juju, I will not give you money. If you will spend your money and do it, whatever you do, all right. You've done it. Other people, they're looking for jobs. I don't want to give bribe. Well, you will not do it. But, you know, we will look at your condition. And we'll do it on your behalf. We know you are deep alive. You will not do it, but we'll do it for you. This is what Abishai said. Abishai said, the time has come. Look at your enemy here. We'll get rid of him. We'll do it on your behalf. Why don't you understand that when somebody says he wants to do evil, he wants to do something unscriptural, he wants to do something ungodly. He wants to do something you know, that is sinful. He's doing it on your behalf if you know it. But you say, no. Look at what David said. And David said in verse 9 to Abishai, destroy him not. Don't do it for me. Don't do it for yourself either. Destroy him not. For who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? Abishai, if you do that, you'll be guilty. If you do that, 
you'll be condemned. If you do that, you'll be damned. If you do that, you'll be deemed. If you, if you touch the anointed of the Lord, the judgment of God will come upon you. That's what he realized and he said, no matter who gives me that advice, I will not accept that advice. That's what the Lord is telling us today. That if you're going to be a man after God's heart, you recognize ungodly counsel, you reject ungodly counsel. I'm looking at Job chapter 2. Job chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 9 and verse 10. Then said his wife unto him, Does thou still retain that integrity cause God and that you, you know the story of Job. You know some people they say, Well, I'm a minister, I'm a child of God, I'm a leader, and this has happened to me. What's God looking at? They begin to challenge God and they begin to say some unprintable words, some people and some terrible wars against the Lord Almighty and but in the case of Job all the children were gone all the servants except one gone all the cattle everything burnt up fire came down from the sky and burnt everything and then Job just worshiped the Lord I came to this world with nothing and I'll go back to my God with nothing Naked came I, and naked will I go back. And he worshiped the Lord. And now something else happened. Boils came all over his body. He took something scratching the body. This was terrible. And then the wife said, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Do you still retain your holiness? Do you still retain your steadfastness? Do you still retain your commitment? Do you still retain your consecration? Are you still going to be steadfast, worshiping God, trusting God, living by the standard of the word of God? Look at what has happened to you. Cause God and die. And Job, number one, did not say, you say that, I divorce you. You see, there are people today, they are waiting for a little problem in the family, a little challenge in the family. And they say, Pastor, you see, my wife was counseling me to backslide. He was telling me that yeah, I shouldn't be committed to God. I shouldn't be working for God. He told, she told me to, die for, uh, to do this. Therefore, I want to serve God. I want to go to heaven. And this woman is a hindrance to me. I'll divorce. Job did not divorce. You see, the people that know the word of God, they're not looking for excuses. Because of this, that's why I do this. Because of that, that's why he do this. He didn't do that. Job did not slap her. Job did not fight. Job did not say, you say that, okay, because you are saying that against God. And you want me to backslide and turn away from God, then slap. Because of the depravity and the anger and the violence in their lives. Job never did anything like that. But then Job recognized that counsel is ungodly. Job recognized that counsel is unscriptural. And look at verse 10. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. He didn't say, You're a fool. He didn't say that. He said, My wife, how do you talk like that? That's how foolish women talk. I'm sure you don't want to be like a foolish woman. Because that thing you have said now is like how the foolish women speak. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil in all this? Did not Job sin with his mouth? He rejected ungodly counsel. When somebody counsels you, you look at that counsel, no matter who that person is, as close to you as a wife, as intimate with you as a husband, and as useful to you 
as a benefactor. But now that benefactor, that helper, that supporter is counseling you to do evil. You will say, no, never. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me and the cross before me. No turning back. No turning back. Though all oppose me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. In health and in sickness, in adversity and prosperity, in challenges and in uh, whatever it is, I'm going to still keep on following the Lord. That's Christianity and that's a man at a God's side. That's a woman at a God's side. That's a worker at a God's side. That's a leader after God's heart. I'm looking at someone. Someone verse 1. We're looking at someone verse 1. It says in someone, the quality of character, the quality of conviction of a man, of a woman that says, here I stand. I stand on the word of God. Let the seas roar. Let the mountains move. Let the counselors counsel. Here is the way. What he need. Those are the people that God accepts as men, as women, as pastors, as leaders after God's heart. Psalm 1 verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the seat in the way of sinners, nor seateth in the seat of this comfort. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree. Those are the people whose ministries are fruitful. Those are the people, their followers will be of a different kind of uh, Christians because they see that that leader, they see that that man, they see that that woman, they see that that worker does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. And it says in verse 3, And it shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leave also shall not wither, Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. He doesn't need to go to a prayer mountain. If he's not walking in the counsel of the ungodly, whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. He doesn't need to go into a valley somewhere. If he's, uh, not re if he's not accepting the counsel of the ungodly, whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. He doesn't need to fast for 40 days, whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. If this is a man that says, I stand on the word, I stand on the promises of God, whatever people think, Whatever people say, however people direct, if it is ungodly, I recognize that, I reject that. And if you reject that, it says, such a man, a man with backbone, such a man, a man with conviction, such a man, a man that knows the straight and the narrow way. And he says, I want to follow that way, such a man, whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I pray you'll be such a man. Am I talking to somebody there? You'll be such a man in Jesus' name. Why do we have such uncompromising people? Such people that say, whatever you say, wherever you are coming from, if this is the word of God, if this is the will of God, and you give me an ungodly counsel, no matter who you are, how close you are, how intimate you are, how helpful you are, how supportive you are, if it is ungodly counsel, I recognize, I reject. What makes them like that? Psalm 16. In Psalm 16, verse 7, it says, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. Ah, oh, wonderful. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. Because God has given me counsel in his word. And he has said, this is the way, walk ye therein. Because God has given me counsel in his word. Touch not the anointed of the Lord. He has given me counsel in his word. And I take to that counsel and I say, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night season. I have searched the Lord always before me. I have searched the Lord always before me. When you search the Lord always before you and you say, I will follow him. 
I will live like he wants me to live. I will obey his word. I will do what he wants me to do. When you set his word before you, and you set the Lord himself before you, you recognize that counsel is different from the counsel of God. And because it is ungodly, because it is unrighteous, because it is unholy, because it's unscriptural, I will not. Then it says in the verse 8, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. These are not people who are wavering here and there. These are not people who are dilly darling. These are not people who cannot make up their minds. They are people who are firm. They are people who are steady. They are people who are steadfast. They are people who are solid. They are people who are scripted. I'm looking at Psalm 64. Psalm 64, I'm reading from verse 2. It says, hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked. You see, David, he realized there are wicked people. There are sinful people. There are backsliding people. There are ungodly people. It says, hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, from the insurrection of the workers of iniquity. I pray when it comes to the time that on scriptural counsels come to you, you will reject them in Jesus' name. Psalm 73, I'm reading from verse 23. Psalm 73, verse 23, it says, Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. I am continually with thee. And thou hast holding me by the right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel. He said, Lord, I'm not looking for all these supporters that do not have conviction in the Bible. I'm not looking for all these sympathizers who do not have backbone to stand whenever there's any problem or any disease or any danger or any challenge. I'm looking up to you. And I'm looking up to you that you will guide me with your counsel. And afterward, receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. It says, my flesh and my heart faileth longing for thee. But God is the strength of my heart and is my portion forever. He'll be your portion in Jesus' name. And that's why the Lord is telling us that when counseling comes, advice from your neighbors, you're old enough to marry. What are you looking at? Well, go to the village and get an unbeliever for you. Remember the word of God. Be not unequal to you together with unbelievers. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. And then he says, I will receive you. You touch not the unclean thing. I'll be a father unto you. You'll be my sons. You'll be my daughters. And to be fulfilled your life in Jesus' name. You see, in the case of, in the case of David, he was suffering. Because was being driven here and there. And somebody said, do you like suffering? Do you like being driven here and there? Let's kill this man. If we kill him, your suffering will be over. He says, I prefer to suffer if I am godly. Rather than you relieve me of my suffering and then I become a backslider. You will not be a backslider in Jesus' name. Point number two. Reviving and retaining an unfettered conscience. Reviving and retaining an unsilenced conscience. Reviving and retaining an unseared conscience. Conscience is a good companion. Conscience is a good partner. Because it is conscious that makes you to know that is wrong. And then you go away from there. That is right. And then you follow that and you pursue that. If you don't have a clean conscience, a cleansed conscience, a clear conscience, a conscience with conviction, a conscience that feels bad when you do something wrong. A conscience that is, if you don't have a conscience, that's such a lot that will tell you this is wrong. That will whip you, literally. And that will make you feel the pain and the pang of doing something bad. You will jump into the fire and you will 
ruin your life because your conscience is totally dead. But in the case of David, come back to 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel chapter 24, I'm reading here from verse 16. In 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 16, he had a conscience that was still sensitive. A conscience that could remind him, knock at the door, shout, scream, David, that is wrong. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 24, and I'm reading here from verse, uh, reading from verse um, 5. For Samuel chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 5. And it came to pass afterward, afterward, after he had done what he did. It came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him. David's heart condemned him. David's heart preached him. David's heart challenged him. David's heart pained him. It came to pass afterwards that David sat, smote him because, because, because he had caught off Saul's skirt. I've done something wrong. I shouldn't have done that. Even though I didn't kill the man, why did I touch the royal robe? The robe of honor that belongs to him. The robe of identity that belongs to him. The robe of his anointing that belongs to him. What did I touch that? What did I cause that? There are people today that do not understand that robe of identity, that robe of honor, and that robe that symbolizes the anointing upon the king upon the prophet upon the pastor upon the shepherd upon the leader in the case of david he realized that and he said i've done something wrong look at verse 11 moreover my father is not going to make confession this restitution when your heart condemns you for doing something wrong you're not to persist in that thing you're to repent you're to return, you're to restore, you're to make restitution. And here it says, Moreover, my father, see ye, see the skirt of thy robe in my hand. For in that I caught off the skirt of thy robe, and kill thee not. Know thou, and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in mine hand. And I have not sinned against thee, yet thou hauntest me, hauntest my soul to take it. And let's look at uh, chapter 24 of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 10. 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 10. It says, it says, and David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people and this is second samuel we're coming from first samuel chapter 24 25 26 27 up to the end and then second samuel chapter 1 up to chapter 24 it's another book entirely many years have gone between first samuel chapter 24 and second samuel chapter 24 and at this time now he did something wrong and the heart still smote him you know what? There are some people, the higher they go, the cooler they become. The higher they go in Christian service. When you are a young person, when you are a young believer, if you did something wrong, your heart will cut. Your heart will smite you. Your heart will prick you. Your heart, your conscience was sensitive. But now, after two years, three years, you've been in that section of ministry now for about seven years, about ten years. The things you will do about seven years ago, and your heart will prick you. You do those things, and you do more than those things now, and your heart says nothing. Your conscience is seared. 
your conscience is dead your conscience is not talking anymore and there are people that you know they can go into the brink the edge the cliff of immorality fornication adultery and they'll say i didn't do the real sin what's the real sin if you look on a woman to lost after her you have committed adultery without already in your heart. What do you mean I didn't do the real thing? Sin is sin. It says abstain from all the appearance of evil. There are people, whatever they do, they can steal church money today and their heart doesn't tell them anything. And when, they were, when you were younger, if you heard that anybody did something like that, sacrilege, to take God's money because God says he have robbed me and ye are cursed because you have robbed me and you do that today and your heart doesn't touch you there are people who can defile a brother's daughter a sister's daughter in the church they gave you that daughter to take care of teach them mathematics teach them science of the teach them this and this instead of teaching the school subject you're teaching immorality and then you're coaching the bible upside down god understands uh, you're a young person i'm the one that is doing it you are you are free and then they give them a kind of instruction that ruins their lives and their hearts say nothing don't feel anything about that. There are people that will deliberately tell a lie and their heart tells them nothing. That all liars shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone because the conscience is now dead. I pray today God will revive our conscience in Jesus' name. You know, in the church, there are people that you see like this and they are the conscience of the church you know that man he will not bend that man he will not bulge that man he will not compromise whatever happens knock him push him pull him down do whatever that man is like the rock of gibraltar is standing that's the conscience of the church it's a point of reference we know brother so and so we know sister so and so they are not going to compromise with you on the minutest thing but those rocks of gibraltar's they're moving they're shaking they're falling because they say it doesn't pay to take a stand everybody looks at you or see you are mr whatever they call you names but you know david he had this conscience from first samuel 24 to second samuel 24 he kept that sensitivity of the conscience and his heart smote him i pray that god will help you i say god will help us in first samuel in first uh, john chapter 3 First John chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 20. First John chapter 3, verse 20. It's talking about the heart. It's talking about the conscience. It says, for if our heart condemn us, you see that, you do something, your heart must talk. Your heart must prick you. Your heart must say something. Your heart must say, that's right. That's not right. That's good. That's bad. That brings condemnation, that brings justification. Your heart must say something. In uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 20, if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Our hearts must be sensitive. In fact, uh, that, that was the thing about uh, Paul the Apostle. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 24. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 16. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 24, verse 16. And it says in chapter 24, verse 16, Acts of the Apostles, it says, And herein do I exercise myself. Herein do I exercise myself before preaching here do i exercise myself after preaching here do i exercise myself with the opposite sex 
herein do I exercise myself. Will somebody else's husband herein do I exercise myself? With neighbors and strangers herein do I exercise myself? I make sure that I retain a clear conscience, a sanctified conscience. A pure conscience all the time. Look at that. Here I do exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. That's Christianity. But a person who has lost the sensitivity of conscience, a person who has lost the pricking of the conscience, whenever he does anything wrong, he wakes, he sleeps, but the conscience has sleep perpetually. No breaking. And there is no condemnation. When something wrong has taken place, that's no more a Christian. That's a backslider. And if you are not careful, you'll become an apostate. It tells us in the word of God in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 15. Romans chapter 2 verse 15. It says, which show the work of the Lord reaching in their hearts. Their conscience also, their conscience also, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts. The meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. It says judgment is coming, judgment is coming. Because judgment is coming, your conscience must be awake. Your conscience must condemn what is wrong. And your conscience must consent to what is right. It also is in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And we're looking at verse 12. A conscience that is clean. A conscience that is clear. A conscience that is uh, at, at a large that will tell you when things are wrong, when things are right. In first, Second Corinthians chapter 1 verse 12, for our rejoicing is this, and the testimony of our conscience. The testimony of our conscience. Examine yourself. Let your conscience tell you whether you are still standing or you are falling. How are you living? How are you living your life? Or are you just a pastor on Sunday? Just a leader when you are with the people of God. What happens in your office? What happens at home? What happens when you go to the village? What happens when believers are not there? Do you go with your conscience? Is your conscience telling you anything? Everything you've been hearing every Sunday, every Monday, every Tuesday, every Saturday, and every Thursday, all the word you've been reading, you've been learning all these many years, do they play any part in your life? And do you have the testimony of conscience that says, that is the way what keep therein? It says, for rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godless sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had a conversation in the world and more abundantly to you, world. Conscience, very important. I'm looking at chapter 4, verse 2. Chapter 4, and we're looking at verse 2. It says, But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, and we're not walking in craftiness and not handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. There are things that your community will approve that God does not approve. There are things that your tribe will approve that God does not approve. There are things that the politics of the land will approve, but God will not approve. There are things that your neighbors will approve. There are things that you'll see many people doing that they say, there's nothing wrong in that. That's how everybody is behaving. But he says, we're commending ourselves to you, to every man's conscience in the sight of God. That's, a, well, that's what he wants for us. And I pray that our conscience will become alive. Will become active. 
so that once again we'll follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall say the Lord. You're not going to know the meaning of holiness or the experience of holiness if the conscience is dead. Because if the conscience is dead, and your conscience cannot tell you that that's holy, that's unholy, that's righteous, that's unrighteous, that's godly, or that's ungodly. Because the conscience is not saying anything anymore. Because the conscience now is seared. Look at second Timothy. We're looking at second Timothy and I'm reading here. First Timothy rather. First Timothy chapter 4. In first Timothy chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 1. First Timothy chapter 4. And we're looking at verse 1 as well as verse 2. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, and having, tell me, having what? Their conscience seared with a hot iron. It's branded. And now he does not feel anything. Can tell a lie, doesn't feel anything. Can commit sin, doesn't feel anything. Can gamble, doesn't feel anything. Can give bribe and take bribe, doesn't feel anything. It's seared conscience. I pray God will deliver us in Jesus' name. How does the conscience become seared? How does the conscience become dead? How does the conscience become blind? How does the conscience become dumb, speechless? Number one, repeated sins. You commit sin, your conscience will shout, No, that's not right. That's backsliding. You repeat that sin again. Your conscience will say shout, but less. Then you keep on doing it and doing it and doing it and your conscience says if frame has joined himself to idols let him alone that's how the conscience becomes dead repeated sins number two deliberate rebellion before you did it you go in that direction what you are thinking about it what you are planning it what you are ruminating to your mind i'm going to do this your conscience is saying but that's not right but you say you are saved but to say you are a child of God, and then you turn deaf ear to the voice of conscience, and you do it in any case. That's deliberate rebellion. It deadens conscience. Self-deception. What self-deception? We're children of Abraham. We have a special place in the kingdom. I am indispensable. If I am not there, nobody else is there. The sea cannot go on without me because of that self-deception. You forget, if you die, church will go on. You forget, if anything happens to you, you are not there. Upon this rock, I build my church, not upon you. Upon the rock. Upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But you deceive yourself, you think that you are that rock. If you are not there, church will not go on. If you are not there, ministry will not go on. Because of that self-deception, that's how the conscience becomes dead, deaf, blind, and dumb. And because of false doctrine. It says they give it to say, false doctrine, doctrines of devils, and they have seared conscience. They come into hypocrisy, and because of delayed judgment, because judgment does not come immediately, and because that judgment has not come, the mind of people, the hearts of people, they are fully set in them to do evil, and it deadens the conscience. Ecclesiastes, I'm reading from chapter 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, we're looking at verse 11. It says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. What do we do? If your conscience has not been silenced, you go back to God and say, God, 
you can resurrect a dead body and you can raise a dead conscience you can revive a dead conscience and lord i come for the revival of my soul revival of my heart and the revival of my conscience i want my conscience to come alive again and that conscience will come back that conscience will wake up and now you commit yourself to living a life that glorifies God. And God will be able to say, he has returned. He has repented. He is restored. That's a minister. That's a man after my own heart. And now you walk carefully. You walk prayerfully. And you walk gently. And you walk according to the word of God. And you are conscious of what you say. What you think. What you do. Where you go. Anywhere during the week. You are conscious of the fact that you have the anointing of God upon your life. And you are not going to just mess up your life. Like you have been doing in the past. I pray that today there will be a restoration. A revival. A renewal of every heart and every conscience. In Jesus name. Now, point number three, reaffirming and reproducing uncompromising concourse. Reaffirming. We need to reaffirm once again that the kind of people God needs in his service, the kind of men, the kind of women, the kind of ministers, the kind of shepherds, the kind of pastors God needs in his service are people that have backbone to stand. The people that can endure your persecution the people that will not misbehave just because there are challenges in their way we reaffirm that today the best only the best is good enough for the kingdom of god we affirm only today that only the vessels who are holy the vessels who are righteous and the vessels who stand according to the word of God, we reaffirm that that is the only instrument that will be useful in the kingdom of God. We reaffirm that God is a holy God and God is a righteous God. And we reaffirm that only the people that are righteous and holy, they are the people that will bear the vessels of the Lord. I'm looking at Psalm 101. Psalm 101. This is a reaffirmation. Psalm 101. It's a psalm of David. I'm looking at verse. I'm looking at verse five. Who so privily, privately slandereth his neighbor? Him will I cut off. Him that has an high look and a proud heart will I not allow? Will I not permit? Will I not suffer? Mine eye shall be upon the faithful of the land. That's a reaffirmation we reaffirm today. That if we're going to serve God, we must be saved. We must be sanctified. We must be steadfast. We must be scriptural sanctified. And we're walking in the holy path that leads to heaven. Mine eye shall be upon the faithful of the land. That they may dwell with me. And he that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. The days are gone when we can manage backsliders, manage sinners, manage liars, manage hypocrites, manage Pharisees, manage religious people that do not have experience of, of standing in the word of God. And they are preaching. The, what is he going to preach? And they are singing. The, what is she going to sing? And they are ministering. What is he going to minister? But the people who are saved and the people who are sanctified and the people who are steadfast we reaffirm that those are the people God needs today. David was such a man. You'll be a man like that. You'll be a woman like that. God will do something in your heart again that you say your conscience has come back. Your heart has come back. Your vision has come back. Your conviction has come back. And you stand on the word of the Lord. Compromise will be something of the past in your life in Jesus' name. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52 verse 1, awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy beautiful garment, so Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more, there shall no more, there shall no more come into thee and uncircumcised and be unclean. If there are people who have come into the ministry, they have come into the leadership. They have come into the priesthood. They have come into the service. And they are uncircumcised in heart. 
uncircumcised and unclean in life, the time has come, the leadership of the church will wake up. I will say, please go and settle about your circumcision. Please go and settle about your circumcision. Leave, shake thyself from the doors. Arise and sit down. O Jerusalem, loose thyself from the pants of thy neck. O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for naught. And ye shall be redeemed without money. Look at verse 7. How beautiful are upon the mountains at the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings, good things of good. Good tidings of good that publishes salvation that says unto Zion, Thy God reigneth, thy watchmen, thy shepherds, thy pastors. Thy preachers, thy what may shall lift up the voice, or the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see, tell me, for they shall see. If somebody does not see eye to eye on sanctification, let him step aside. If somebody does not see eye to eye on no divorce and remarriage, let him step aside. If somebody does not see eye to eye that at the end of his sinful life, there's going to be hellfire, let him step aside. If somebody does not see that this word of God is infallible and we stand on this word of God and we're to honestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints, if you don't see eye to eye with us, and you're not willing to contend what well, the faith was delivered unto the saint step aside but the people that see eye to eye the people that are watchmen will watch over the doctrine will watch over the disciples will watch over the kingdom will watch over everything the lord has given us and it says that watchmen shall lift up the voice what well, the voice together shall they sing it says they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion, look at verse 11, depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from things and touch no unclean thing, go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. It will happen to you today. I said it will happen to you today. Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. These are the kinds of ministers who want to reproduce. These are the kind of pastors who want to reaffirm. These are the kind of workers who want to raise up again. So that by the grace of God, whether we are Babylon, in Babylon or Rome or anywhere, whether you are in a local government or region, whether you are in a state, anywhere you are, you will stand for this word of God and you will stand... And you will not compromise in Jesus' name. Reaffirming and reproducing uncompromising concourse. It tells us in verse Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the priest of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. No wonder God used that man. And God is going to use you. I said God is going to use you. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 19. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're looking at it from verse 19. It tells us in verse 19, it says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone, let everyone, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. In verse 21, if a man therefore purge himself from this, the time has come. You have to beat yourself. You have to look at your life. Look at where you are today. Look at where you were many, many years ago. And think about the ungodly counsel that has come to you. And then you just walk here and walk here. And you are wobbling. You are not really walking. And you are not living according to the standard. You are looking at your life today. You are saying, oh Lord, something has gone wrong. I'm not as stable as I was, not as steady as I was, not as solid as I was. I'm not as single-minded as I was in the past. And now you come back. You are coming back today. And when you come back, the church will come back, will come to the foundation again. Because if a man therefore purge himself from these, it shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, 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 and made for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. God will prosper this work in our hands. 
as we come back and we see eye to eye, I agree with that. I agree with that. And I'm going to consecrate myself. I'm going to lay everything on the altar. I'm going to have the same heart with the people of God, the same mind with the people of God. No compromise anymore. And whatever the challenge, I'm going to stand on the word of God. I'm going to retain. I'm going to revive. There is a sensitive conscience. And then I'm going to live according to the word of God. He says that we're prepared unto every good work. And you remember to flee youthful laws, but we'll follow righteousness and faith and charity and peace with them that call on the name of the Lord out of a pure heart. Can it happen today? I said, will it happen today? And then God will be able to say about you, like he said about David, look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 13, Acts of the Apostles chapter 13 verse 22. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart which shall fulfill all my will. In the present condition in which many of the leaders are, the knees are weak. In the present condition in which the leaders are, leaders who are pastors, leaders among the women, leaders among the youths, leaders in the campus, leaders on the campus, and leaders of the children's section and sectional leaders in the condition in which we are that the conscience has not awakened we cannot fulfill the lord's will and the lord cannot say about us i have found him i have found her a man a woman after my own heart but from tonight something will turn around from tonight something will change a transformation in Jesus' name. And then we'll live a life that is militant and triumphant. And then we'll become more than conquerors on this path that leads to glory, that leads to heaven. Somebody said, I think it's John Wesley, said, give me a hundred men that hate nothing but sin. Fear nothing but sin and love nothing but God and we will turn the world upside down. I say, give me a hundred men and women in every local government, in every region, in every state and in your city here. Hundred men and women that hate nothing but sin, that fear nothing but sin that love righteousness and holiness, that love God with all their heart, all their soul, and all their mind. Those hundred men that say, here is our dedication. Here is our consecration. Here is our commitment. We will turn every city in this nation towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Multitudes, millions will get saved in Jesus' name. It can start here tonight. It will start here tonight. It will start with you. Are you there? What are you? Push everything aside and cry to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. Give me a hundred men, a hundred women that fear nothing and hate nothing but sin, that love nothing beyond God, loving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. A hundred men that are focused and fervent and faithful and then will turn everything around in every tribe and in every state, in every local government. Here is the day, the day of transformation. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. We'll call on the state of us here to lead us in prayer now. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. You're going to dedicate yourself afresh once again unto the Lord. You reject ungodly counseling. And then we revive this uh, unseared conscience, unsilenced conscience, and then we raise uncompromising concourse.